welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, the show where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. As always, you can listen to the show wherever podcasts are sold, iTunes, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you uh, purchase your, your podcast sound. You can also check out our website, supercriticalpodcast.com, for a full list of episodes and the occasional bonus feature or two. But let's get started with tonight's episode. My name is Tim Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear security for a living. Tonight, I am joined via Skype by Mike, a former colleague of mine who has a keen eye for movies, but unlike me, isn't bogged down by the need to nitpick the nuclear stuff. Thanks for joining, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be on my first podcast here. Looking forward to talking about this movie, which is, to this day, is, I think, one of the scariest movies I have seen. <laughs> well, well, very good. Well, so as as you may have heard uh, in our previous episodes, we usually like to spend two hours or so over analyzing a movie or a TV show that's really all about nukes. But in tonight's episode, we'll continue our mini nuke series, where instead of covering something that is drenched in nuclear plot, we will just talk about something that you know dips its toes into the nuclear water. And speaking of dipping our toes in water. Our episode tonight is all about the creature that terrorized Mike growing up and us all and made us afraid to go in the water. Because we're, tonight we're talking about Jaws, the 1975 movie with the poster tagline, the terrifying motion picture from the number one bestseller. I guess it was a book. Uh, Mike, do you, have this, do you have the book report ready for this? Um, yeah, yeah. I pulled it out from... Uh fifth grade so yeah ready to go well that's why that's why you're terrified you shouldn't read this book as a fifth grader yeah i was a little young so yeah well i didn't know i honestly did not know it was a book but i do know that it was directed by steven spielberg and one of his first actually probably his first uh theatrical film i know he did a tv movie called duel uh which is really good it's about the guy who's uh, he's late for work and he's trying to travel somewhere and he's harassed by an 18 wheeler on the road in some in the desert that's a good movie but it's, you know, you try to, you, first you do chase by a car, then you do chase by a shark. It's, it's all kind of the same thing. Right. But we have three main cast members for this. It's a kind of a small movie. There's a few other fun characters, but really we should be concerned with three main characters. We've got uh, Roy Schneider playing Martin Brody, who is a former big city cop and now the sheriff of a small town beach on Amity Island, uh, which I guess is supposed to be like Martha's Vineyard, somewhere up was, there was in the northeast. part of it shot there, right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I know that when, when my wife and I went there a few years ago, we were I was looking for the Jaws stuff. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I saw anything in particular, but we looked for fins for sure. It's also starring Robert Shaw, who plays Quint, a former Navy man who is now a grizzled fisherman slash shark hunter. Pretty good profession. Uh, and then we got Richard Dreyfus, who plays uh, Matt Hooper, who I like to think is a marine biologist with... Too much money, too many scars, and too little sense, because he jumps in a cage with a shark. But I'll say, point of right. unnecessary clarification here, uh, Robert Shaw is not to be confused with the one who is the program director for the <laughs> Export Control and Nonproliferation Program at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies in Monterey. No one else needs to hear that, but he's, he's a guy I took a class with online. He knows a lot about nuke stuff. But I don't, I don't know about his expertise when it comes to shark hunting. Point of clarification for anyone that might be concerned that maybe it's the same guy. I imagine he gets that sometimes. In terms of the reception for this movie, you know, the consensus is people like this movie. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's got 97%. I don't know who those 3% are that don't like it, but most people do. It's the number seven all-time biggest box office when you adjust for inflation. Roger Ebert gave it four stars. It's got three sequels, a video game, and a theme park ride. So All right, yeah. it's done well for itself. These The sequels were not directed by Spielberg? Is that... Yeah, they weren't. <laughs> okay, um, that's what I thought. The second one, I remember not being too bad. It's kind of got a fun uh, story there. It's like almost more on land. So that they don't go out to sea. It's all kind of in the water cove area uh, near the Amity Island, I think. Um, but the other, th th other two are nonsense. I think the third one is called Jaws 3D. So it was taking advantage of the 3D trend that seems to be back now. So I'm sure yeah. they should maybe try it again. And then Jaws 4 is just kind of a mess. That's the one where the shark goes, like, tries to come back for revenge. It knows that the Brody family killed its ancestors, and now it's out for revenge. 
if I'm not mis- I think I read that uh, Martha's Vineyard, which is where a lot of it is filmed, they had actually experienced like a 15,000 person increase from the summer that was filmed huh. to the following summer around that time. So it actually resulted in um, an increase of in tourists, which is kind of counterintuitive. You would think if so, you yeah. Really think about it, but hey, I, you know, if it works, it works. Yeah, people somehow. Like, and it's good for the people at Martha's Vineyard. They need their beach money. Right, right. Their summer, their summer beach money. That's all they. At that's all, all they want. At all costs. Yep. Yeah. Let's let's get started here. Let's break into the plot of this. Uh, we don't have to spend too much time uh, because you know people that listen to this probably have seen Jaws, and if you haven't seen Jaws. Uh, what are you doing? Stop this podcast, watch Jaws, uh, and then get back to us. But Mike, as the guest of honor, would you like to lead us in a, a quick plot discussion of, of the, the movie Jaws that terrified you as a small child? Yeah, sure. So it basically starts off the opening scene with two people on a beach at night, someone swimming out, ultimately getting pulled down by something that you can't see, though I think instinctively the audience knows it's it's a shark. The next day or so, there's Mark Brody, who's the sheriff of this town, Amity, I believe it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's from New York, from the big city, and for whatever reason, it seems like he wasn't happy there. Now he's here. He's big sheriff, small town kind of situation. He finds the uh, body of this girl, all, or what's left of it, rather, the following day on the beach. Had, is told by a few people maybe it's a propeller, maybe it's something else. He wants to be cautious, so he has a bit of a confrontation with the mayor. Who, I love I love the mayor in this movie. Yeah, really is the stereotype personified of the politician mm-hmm. who's in, focused on ensuring profits at all costs. And so he, of course, the mayor is adamantly opposed to even putting a temporary halt on people coming to the ocean, let alone going in the water. The mayor does get his way in the short term. Ultimately, what happens in one of the following scenes is that uh, a young boy gets eaten by the shark, ostensibly Hmm. the same shark. We don't, again, we don't see much of the shark, but we do see the fin this time. So at this point, there is, and I believe I'm still on the timeline here, there's a meeting with the mayor, um, local town folk, the sheriff, discussing what they're going to do about this, where the mayor effectively offers a $3,000 reward for anyone who can bring the shark in and kill it. At this point, they just think it's like a regular shark, you know? Yeah, there's no idea of how large it is or, you know, any sort of, as we'll get to later, maybe extra cunningness on the shark's part or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever. So at this point, we're in a small uh, meeting space where we get introduced to Quint, who's arguably the best character, most interesting character in this movie. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe in, in you know the past couple decades of these types of movies. He, and he gives off the air of you know this character that we've probably seen in previous movies, someone who's been there, seen it, has the scars to prove it, and, mm-hmm. and is, is listening to everyone talk about this terrifying thing like they know what to do with it. Um, essentially, he says he'll go catch and kill the shark but he asks for an increase, $7,000 increase. So he wants $10,000. That doesn't happen. So you, what you have is essentially everyone and their mother out on boats <laughs> trying to catch the shark. I think also all of them are drunk, too. A lot of them are drunk. Yeah, yep. the fishermen, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and around this time, Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss, who is the marine biologist. And I can't I can't stop thinking about George Costanza when, I, when he says he's a marine biologist. But, <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. uh, not the same, not the same situation. But he comes because I think he's heard about the attack or the attacks that have happened. He meets with the sheriff, goes and looks at the remains of the girl who was killed at the beginning of the movie, and he flat out says, "This was not a propeller. This was not an accident. This was a shark. And not only was what was it a shark? It's bigger than I've ever seen or knew existed." Yeah. So both uh, both Hooper and uh, Sheriff Brody confront the mayor about this. Again, all their warnings seem to fall on deaf ears, especially after some of the town folk come back with a shark they've actually caught. And at this point, the mayor wants to believe, and most people want to believe, that this was the shark that was killing people and, and they can go back to their normal lives. Of course, the marine biologist Hooper says, no, this is probably a tiger shark this is could be the shark we were looking for but mm-hmm. probably isn't it's probably still out there you probably want to play it safe of course they don't a little while later people are in the water you know it's fourth of july yeah they keep talking about it's fourth of july weekend it's like they make all their money 
over the course of the year, it's like nothing compared to what they make in the summer on the beach. Right, it's like, it's, it's, it's a like big deal for them. Break, yeah, make a break financially. The mayor sees that no one's actually going in the water. They're all they're all sitting and lounging on on the sand. No one's going in. So he gets one of the people he knows basically forces him to go into the water. <laughs> To lead by example, and it works. You know, it, a bunch of kids, everyone else joins them, and they all go in. They're having a good time. They're frolicking. But of course, it doesn't take long until the actual shark shows up. This time, it it kills a full-grown person, almost kills the son of the sheriff because he goes into shock as a result. Oof. At this point, we're in a hospital with uh, the sheriff's son is recovering and you can see the mayor is noticeably shaken up he's he's vocally telling himself what he did was in the interest of the town mm -hmm. and at this point the sheriff convinces him to let him offer the extra money to quint so he and hooper and quint can go out on a boat and track the shark and kill it so the three of them go out on a boat I believe it's quint's the orca yeah and this is this is probably I would say, what, almost half the movie? I always think it's longer on the boat than yeah. it is. It actually might be almost close to a third of it's on the boat. I have to look at it, but it's definitely not you know, any more than a half of the movie. Right. People, people like always forget that that part of the movie. It's like in Willy Wonka. People, people forget that half of the movie is they're not even in the chocolate factory. It's like all this <laughs> other stuff that no one cares about. It's like get to the, get to the chocolate factory, get on the boat. Right. Yeah, there's a bit of build up to, to them getting out on the ocean, obviously. You know, you have to build build up this uh this menace lurking beneath the ocean. But once they're on the boat, I can sort of tell it's a Spielberg movie because there's a good blend of, you know, comedic relief and action and suspense. There's a bit of classism going on between mm -hmm. Quint and Cooper. For some reason I always remember the term college boy, uh, being thrown about saying, you know, you know, you pay all, pay all this money for, for this college, but you don't know how to tie a knot, et cetera. So, <laughs> well, as someone who's paying student loans forever, uh, and certainly Quint really got right to my right to my gourd, really got me in the gourd. Yeah, yeah, I think that applies to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a while while they're on the the ocean. Um, initially, they, I believe, they come into contact with the shark. You're gonna need a bigger boat. They see it, and their basic strategy is to sort of tire it out by shooting it with a spear gun that then attaches via rope to a number of heavy barrels. Mm -hmm. which, so it's, yeah, yeah, you would think that it would; these barrels would keep the shark from submerging underwater. Quince maybe killed a couple sharks before. This is his right. thing; he knows how to do it. But I don't think he's ever come up against something like this. And this is the point in the film where we realize that. The shark is, is not a normal shark. Not only is it 25 feet long, it's also clearly more intelligent than a shark should be, certainly any kind of shark. And we realize this because no matter how many times they shoot it and attach barrels to it, it, it still manages to go under the boat. It still loses the barrels. So they realize they're up against something more challenging than they thought. Mm -hmm. So after one or two of these encounters, there's a scene, and this is probably one of the more memorable scenes in film, where the three of them sort of get drunk up in the boat at night after dinner, and they're they're exchanging, kind of do, doing this pissing contest <laughs> where they're saying, you know, who has the bigger scars, um, you know, who's been through the most, who has more of a right to call themselves a man, essentially. Uh, Dreyfus's character, Hooper, of course, Shows a few scars. One of them, he claims, was caused by, I think it was a manta ray. Mm -hmm. uh, Quint shows, like, a loose tooth or a tooth he got knocked out. The, the two of them, they, they keep sort of going back and forth. And in the something I think is interesting is in the background, you see Sheriff Brody. He almost wants to jump in there. <laughs> um, and he starts to sort of lift his shirt up to reveal what is clearly a scar. But then, then he puts it back down and actually doesn't say anything. And in this... This sort of speaks to his hesitation to go into the water, which is made clear earlier in the movie, but never really just it's never really explained why he's afraid of the water. So you get get an image of maybe something traumatic happening to him hmm. as a child and, and maybe he just doesn't he can't talk about it. But that never doesn't really get resolved. But in this scene, the most important thing, certainly for our purposes, is that they're all laughing, having a good time. Then Quint really uh 
dampens the party when he when you reveal to them that he was in fact on the USS Indianapolis during World War II, which for everyone listening is is the ship that brought parts for the atomic bomb that was used against Japan at Hiroshima. And this is a ship that was uh, sunk by torpedoes by the Japanese, which resulted in a lot of men being out on the open ocean, eaten by ravenous sharks. And, and Quint was able to survive this. Forget exactly how many people survived, but um, I, I know we'll get to that. But he basically, you know, one thing he says is, you know, I'll, I can't ever put a lifesaver on after that. I can't really go into the water. So what ensues essentially is a final showdown between the three of them and the shark. Quint perhaps poetically gets eaten by the shark. Dreyfus's character goes under a cage, essentially underwater mm-hmm. in a cage to get close to it so that he can... I think poison it with a with a spear. Yeah, uh, that does doesn't work out because the shark <laughs> almost tears through the cage. Yeah, because it's a twenty five foot three ton shark. That's probably why. Right. <laughs> That's just my educated guess. It's probably a gigantic shark that didn't let this happen. An intelligent gigantic shark, right? Yeah, that'll yeah. usually that'll usually do it. Yeah. And for most of the rest of the movie, it's just the sheriff alone on the boat, which ends up sinking because the shark keeps ramming into it in an attempt to sink it. So it's clearly, a, it's a shark on a mission at this point. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Sheriff Brody is able to actually finally explode the shark by tricking it into eating a... a scuba tank. A, yeah. a scuba tank, right. And then shooting it while it approaches him with its mouth open. Why are you son of a... <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it was it was a tasty looking scuba tank. Right, you, right. You see a scuba <laughs> tank there. He's clearly hungry. He's a big growing shark. He's going to eat it. Right. So the shark blows up. All the while, of course, uh, Hooper is, I believe, he's hiding underneath uh, the <laughs> ship because uh, he narrowly escapes the cage and was able to stay submerged underwater um, with his tank, I think. But so he finally resurfaces after the explosion, meets with the sheriff who's at this point doing the whole Kate Winslet from Titanic, you know, <laughs> securing himself to part of the the ship that was blown up. And they paddle happily ever after back to the shore at that point. You know, sounds like they're in a pretty good mood at that point. Yeah, that that is the end of the film. There's a closing shot of the two of them paddling to the coast, which for some reason reminds me of the ending of Shawshank Redemption uh, in Say Wath and Tenejo. Mm-hmm. I'll let you guys decide about that. <laughs> I never thought I'd see my friend Hooper again. <laughs> kind of touching, you know. Yeah. I always wonder what Hooper and Brody did when they got to shore. Like, did they go take a nap? Did they have a steak dinner? Did they, I don't know. So I'm like, what would you do after something like that? I guess, you know, see your family and something, but have a drink? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe go, go. I, I assume they go straight to the, sh- to the mayor, to the mayor's office. And punch um, him in the face. <laughs> something like that, yeah. That would have made a, made a better sequel, I think. But. Yeah, that's the mayor to turn in his suit that has anchors on it. And he's no longer going to be mayor. Thanks, Mike. I think that's a pretty good uh, breakdown of the plot and sets us up pretty well for our next section where we'll be talking about the nuclear points, the the whole USS Indianapolis scene. Because um, as you mentioned, they sit around in the, in the boat at night uh, drinking, which I didn't know, was as, but I read this, uh, apricot brandy. <laughs> and they don't drink whiskey. They don't drink anything else. They're apricot brandy. <laughs> so I'll play the scene right now just so that everybody kind of gets where we're all on the same page. Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into our side chief. He was coming back from the island of Tinian to Lady, just delivered the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb. But our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. Very first light, chief. Sharks come cruising. Sometimes that shark, he looks right into you, right into your eyes. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white and then... So 1,100 men went in the war. 
316 men come out, the sharks took the rest, June the 29th, 1945. Anyway, we delivered the bomb. Yeah, so this scene is interesting. This is a, we talked about earlier how this movie was based on a book. This whole scene and the whole thing of Quint being an old Navy man from the USS Indianapolis is an addition that they added in to the movie, which I thought was kind of cool. So it's definitely something that they, they thought about and, and decided to put into it. They brought in a few other guys to, to come in and punch up the dialogue and to write some scenes. The guy who wrote this monologue is, is a director and a writer named John Millis, who you may know he directed Red Dawn, the, the old Cold War <laughs> scare movie, and a bunch of the Dirty Harry movies. So he is famous for the lines of, uh, go ahead and make my day. Do you feel lucky, punk? Also, he wrote the line, I love the smell of napalm in the morning from uh, Apocalypse Now. And uh, this, is, this guy is a, a renaissance man. He's the inspiration for Walter Sobchak well, in The Big yeah. Lebowski. <laughs> and he's the... So you know of, he's interesting. Yeah. He's, he's probably the most interesting man in the world. He also was someone who helped to start the Ultimate Fighting Championships, the UFC. And it was the, uh, the guy who came up with the idea of them fighting in an octagon. So <laughs> this guy has kind of done a bit of everything. Uh, I right. think he's, he's famous for being uh, a strong, you know, red-blooded conservative in liberal Hollywood. He's got some writing chops, because this scene, I remember, this is one of my favorite scenes in all of film. I always wanted to memorize it, and then when you have to do, you know, you're sitting around a campfire and everybody's doing, talking about their talents or singing a song, I always wanted to do this monologue. <laughs> I'm still working on it, and I, I think I'm just going to go out trying to find some camping trips. Maybe camping on the beach the, right. the, the night yeah. before we go out on the beach, and I'll just do that whole thing, scare, scare course, my fellow campers. That, I think we talked about how it, it got maybe one of the highest nods you can get by being parodied and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's, it's pretty good. I think a lot of yeah. people, I watched the YouTube video of it recently, and all the, mm -hmm. uh, the commenters said, uh, I, I just saw this in a, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and someone told me to check it out. Enough of that. Let's get to the, the actual story itself. So you, you did a good job of kind of starting it. Let me go through a little bit of the things that I saw. Because it's really a fascinating story. Because it's real. It's not something that they just made up for, for the movie. It was the greatest single loss of life at sea in the history of the U.S. Navy. In addition to being the largest shark attack in recorded history. So it's 1945. You have the USS Indianapolis, which is a Portland-class Navy cruiser. It's not a huge ship. It's very fast. It doesn't have its, a lot of guns. It doesn't have the radar capability to detect submarines that are trying to blow it up. But it, it's fast, usually has a protective escort. But it was the perfect ship that the U.S. military and the U.S. scientists and government that were involved in the Manhattan Project, when they needed a ship to take the parts from the atomic bomb from where it was being constructed very quickly to Tinian, where uh, the Enola Gay eventually took off to drop the bomb on Hiroshima, they decided that the USS Indianapolis, which had just gone through a couple different battles and was in California and San Francisco being repaired, it was ready to go, and they decided to, to use that particular ship. And this was the, the Hiroshima bomb, the little, bo little boy, as it's known. So it left San Francisco July 16th and delivered the parts on July 26th. So in 10 days, it crossed the Pacific. And that's a pretty fast ship. It was traveling without a protective escort. So after it finished this mission of dropping off the parts uh, for the atomic bomb, it then went to Guam to refuel. Uh, and then on the 28th, so a couple, two days after it dropped off the parts, it was on its way to the Philippines to do a little bit more training missions to get ready for a possible land mm -hmm. invasion of Japan. But mission success. Pretty much everything's good so far. But unfortunately for the people on that boat, Stuff got crazy on July 30th. Early in the morning, the ship was hit by two torpedoes fired by a Japanese submarine that had been patrolling in that area for quite a while. The boat sank in 12 minutes, which I think is terrifying to think about. Like, you imagine you're asleep in the middle of the night, and then 12 minutes later, you're stuck in the middle of the ocean with no one. I'll fly on a, yeah, I'll fly on a plane before a submarine any day, really. It's uh, pretty scary. Oh, boy. 1,196 sailors and Marines were aboard the ship uh, when, when it was unsunk. 900 of them ended up in the water. The rest of the people went down with the ship or, or died in the explosions. Because the explosions of the torpedoes targeted the power center. So the power went out, uh, which is one of the problems why they weren't able to evacuate as many people. Because the evacuation orders, they didn't have an intercom 
that they could tell everybody to jump off the ship, go to a life, you know, lifeboat, uh, which I guess there weren't a lot of lifeboats too. Uh, so it was pretty frantic. Over four days, the, the sailors and the Marines that were in the water were exposed to the sun, dehydration, because there was no fresh water, very hungry. There were a couple of rations that they found, but most of the time uh, they, they, you know, they starved for those couple of days. And on top of that, uh, as Quint and Mike mentioned, there were some sharks that started to attack them. And the whole time, no one reported them missing because the ship was supposed to arrive in the Philippines on July 31st, but there was no requirement at that particular time in the Navy to report ships of that size that were larger ships missing if they didn't show up. Obviously, this changed after the event. Um, the Navy had some new procedures on tracking ships at sea, but it wasn't until an anti-submarine military plane, fortunately a U.S. plane, saw them and then called for rescue on August 2nd. So between the 30th and August 2nd, they were pretty much floating at sea. 321 sailors and Marines were pulled out of the water, and only 317 survived. So a couple of those that were pulled out of the water uh, still succumbed to their injuries. Yeah. Um, obviously, the crew was mad because their ship was, <laughs> was sent from Guam without a protective escort. There was intel that the military had, supposedly, that was showing that a Japanese attack sub was in those waters. But the message never made its way to the captain of the USS Indianapolis. And in, a message was, and this is something I didn't know about, a message was intercepted by the Japanese attack submarine that basically was talking about them celebrating that they destroyed the, the ship, which they thought was a much larger ship, but they, you know, celebrating that they destroyed it. But the U.S. military thought that it might be a trick to get them to come do a rescue and then they'd be attacked again. So they didn't believe it. One of the saddest part about this whole story is is the captain of the USS Indianapolis was court-martialed over this whole thing because someone had to be blamed and a lot of people who who may be their fault for not telling them that there was a Japanese attack submarine that didn't give them a protective escort all of these different factors you know someone had to be blamed so they they blamed the captain is fascinating they at by that by that time the Japanese had surrendered and they subpoenaed the captain of the Japanese attack submarine to come to the trial, the court-martial trial. And they asked him, is there anything the captain could have done to avoid your attack? We ordered him to, wow. to zigzag back and forth, and that's like a technique that they can do to avoid submarines. And he's like, oh, no, we know you do that. We have ways to track you even still. We would have gotten you. But regardless, he was court-martialed, and it wasn't until the year 2000 when he was exonerated by Bill Clinton. Finally right. came through yeah. this. But unfortunately... A few years before that, the captain took his own life because he lived with the guilt that he felt that it was his responsibility and his fault that they were attacked and everyone had to go through this. So it's kind of a, it's a it's a pretty sad story there. At least there was some ending there for his family and for history, but it, it's quite an ordeal. Yeah, for sure. And it makes sense why this would be something that the writers and the director of this movie would want to have one of their characters, you know, talk about it. My favorite part of that scene is. When, because they're laughing, they're drinking, they're laughing, they're having a good time. Brody asks uh, Quint, "What is that tattoo that looks like it had been removed?" And Ho and Hooper's joking, "Oh, but it said mom, uh, or something like that. It said your mother, or heart, or <laughs> is it a sweetheart?" And my favorite line is because Hooper's joking, because they're joking, and then Quint just puts his hand on him, and it's almost to say like, "This is a serious thing, son. Don't make, don't laugh." And then he says he's on the USS Indianapolis. And then Hooper's eyes just go from, you know, laughter to complete solemn stare. And just, you were on the USS Indianapolis? And it just, the whole scene turns. It's one of my favorite parts right. of that. Yeah, that, that's, that was, yeah, I think as you were talking about some subtle acting there, uh, you see Quint's face sort of just, it becomes sort of morose and almost pale at, at times. So. Yeah. This is a guy who is a grizzled man this entire time, you know, joking, singing, um, you know, various Irish drinking songs, and mm -hmm. uh, just all of a sudden has the thousand-yard stare and tells his story. But as good as the scene is, as powerful as the acting is, uh, it's our job on this podcast to get super critical about it. So here's a couple things that I that I came across when I did some research for this, and I, I think it's interesting. So I want to you know get your reaction to this as someone Great. who maybe have watched the movie a couple times. You know, when since between the ages of five and now, <laughs> uh, 
But this is, these are some things that I, that I found really interesting about the nuclear side of this. So Quint's story, basically, is, is more or less correct. Um, there's even parts of his story where he says, you know, he talks about the sailor friend of his whose legs were bitten off and no one knew. He basically was, he got tipped over and then you upside down and you could see that his legs were bitten off. Like that's a story, that's a real survivor account. So all these different details are, are really interesting, but there are some odd things that they do get wrong from the history of the nuke side and also just a few weird kind of technical things. Uh, one, for example, the date is wrong that he says. He says it was June the 29th when the ship was sunk. But, you know, as we talked about, it was actually July 30th. Right. I, I would say maybe it was because the character had been drinking a bunch of apricot brandy. That may be the reason, because he was also wearing an army jacket instead of a navy jacket. Uh, <laughs> a few things like that, but that's okay. Maybe he had just been drunk for a really long time when he bought the jacket. But supposedly, the actor himself had a bit of an alcohol problem, and he thought that he would be a method actor during this scene, because they're drinking in the scene. Why doesn't he drink as the actor, and it will fit well? But I guess the first time they did it, it the results were terrible. Uh, he didn't like them, the actors didn't like them, the director didn't like it, and he apologized. He said, let me try it again the next day sober, and then he comes to the, they come to the set and they nail it. And that's the one that we see. So it's actually the second attempt at this. It should be added that the actor who played Quint, Robert Shaw? Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, not, he, again, not the professor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Full disclosure. Apparently, out of all the money that this film made, being what the highest grossing film of, of a summer up to that point. In, seventh, in, seventh of all time. Seventh uh, of all time. When you, in, you know, adjust for inflation. Right. So despite the enormous financial success, uh, the actor didn't make a dime because he huh. went into this movie already having troubles with the IRS, and apparently he there were there there are several. We could maybe do a whole podcast on this, but there were complications between him and the IRS and the fact that they were shooting in these several different locations. That at the end of the day, he essentially in order to incur any further uh, penalties or jail time or, or whatever, he, he didn't – he basically wasn't paid. Oh, so wow. You're talking, you're talking about an unpaid actor here at the end of the day. An unpaid actor who's like one of the best <laughs> actors of all time doing one of the best movies and scenes of all time. Wow, I didn't so know that. I have, to, I have to think that somehow even subconsciously affected his performance. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe help, you know? Well, supposedly it was one of the worst uh, and most difficult shoots. Like, it's really hard to film on water, and it's Spielberg's first movie. It's difficult. My, my family, uh, my, my uncles had boats, so we were always out on the water during the summer, and it's hard just kind of walking around. And as a kid, I didn't like it as much as I probably would, you know, if I was a, a, an adult man to appreciate it. I can imagine. I mean, it's hard enough to walk around, and then, except then imagine trying to film, keep you know, sound going and, and the lighting to be right. And the whole time there's the shark, the robotic sharks not working, <laughs> all this crazy stuff. Wild. Uh, I guess I should have mentioned earlier that the shark's nickname on set was Bruce, which I guess is the, <laughs> the name of Spielberg's lawyer. So yeah, great touch. But a couple other things were odd about the scene. So not only was the date wrong, but he got the numbers off a little bit. Uh, he says that 1100 went in the water, which, you know, it's a, it's a good number, but it was it was nine hundred. So he, he ex exaggerates the number a little bit. He says that three hundred and sixteen came out of the water. Well, it was actually three twenty one that came out alive, and three seventeen that eventually survived. So these are little things that are nitpicky. It's just kind of fascinating that you would have the real life story and then not have the, the details correct. But again, it makes sense when you think about the fact that he redid the scene, and the scene is great. So mm -hmm. maybe we don't. I shouldn't nitpick. Um, the details. But the things that I will nitpick are some of the stuff. When he says that he delivered the A-bomb, the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb, that his cadence there is great. They didn't actually deliver the whole bomb. I think this is something that's, that's interesting. So on the boat, there were two things that got loaded very much hush-hush, secret. Pretty much everybody on the boat, even the captain, who claims later on he knew what it was, but all real accounts show that they didn't know what was on there. That, the, that these bomb materials were there. They knew it was something having to do with the war and that it was top secret. That's pretty much it. There were two things that they loaded, a giant crate, and then they also brought on a tiny little canister, like a cylinder canister that they took into the first lieutenant's quarters 
and made a makeshift cage by welding a, a metal box over this cylinder so that no one can get to it except for these two guys who were scientists on the Manhattan Project who were undercover. They were pretending oh. to be artillery people. One guy who was actually former military and had a little bit of experience with artillery and another one who had no idea what he was talking about and they kept the other sailors kept asking him questions like oh where did you serve what kind of <laughs> what things did you work on we had this problem with our our guns can you fix it and the entire time he's like uh i don't really know <laughs> but their whole job was to check the radiation from the cylinder to see yeah. if to make sure everything was okay but in these crates were the firing mechanism for the bomb so this was this is what's called a gun type uranium design bomb so there are basically two types of at that time there are two types of um of nuclear weapon designs there was the gun type which is only uranium it only uses enriched uranium it can't use plutonium and the idea is you know when you have an atomic bomb you have to be able to get your fissile material your uranium in a configuration so that when it the uranium is hit with a neutron that it breaks apart and the other neutrons that are created when you break it apart it also releases energy, the kind of thing that causes the gigantic boom. But it also produces more neutrons. And those neutrons will then go break off other elements of uranium. And it creates this chain reaction. And it's like one explodes, then four, then eight. It's like an exponential chain reaction, a super critical chain reaction. But you don't want the fissile material stored in that configuration where that particular thing can happen. Cause then you're really asking for trouble. It's like having uh, a loaded gun with a hair trigger pointed at your head the entire time. You want to keep, yeah. when you're just walking around town, you, you take the gun and you unload it and you check to make sure everything's safe and you keep those things separated. So the gun design is kind of what you would imagine it. There was a conventional explosion on one side of the bomb that would launch one mass of uranium into another mass of uranium. And they would squish together to the type of configuration that they would need. And then there would be a neutron that would be injected into it. And that's what would cause the bomb to be fired. So in the crate was the firing mechanism for this chain reaction. And it's actually fascinating. The, the, one of the reasons why the boat left when it did was they were waiting. It was slightly delayed. The scientists that were aboard the boat were waiting to get a report if the Trinity test, the first test of a nuclear bomb out in Alamogordo, New Mexico... They were checking to see if that had worked because if it didn't work, they wouldn't have gone to do the rest of the mission. They would have held mm. off to figure out what happened, but they, they got a report that it worked. And the Trinity bomb is a plutonium bomb, which is an entirely separate configuration. Instead of having two pieces of uranium kind of hit together, this is more of a spherical shape that has explosive charges around the outside of the plutonium so that it kind of goes from the size of a small basketball like you know those little basketballs you'd have in your room that you would put on the back of your door and you would shoot oh, like yeah. that like a little handheld one that would basically take a size about that big maybe a little bigger maybe like a soccer ball and then it would through these conventional explosions would would fire everything at the exact same time so that it squishes into even a smaller ball about the size of like a tennis ball or a golf ball so and then that's in that configuration that you need and then you introduce a neutron and then it, it goes off so that's that one type of of bomb design that Trinity tested. That was a complicated design. They didn't know if it would work. The bomb that Quint brought over, the bomb parts, that whole um, little boy configuration, the gun type design was never tested. They just knew it would work. It's that simple. The design that the South Africa had, which they never tested theirs either, uh, at least not publicly, was a gun type design. It's very simple. It's not that complicated. Well, so, so they, were, they were counting on it working, not necessarily knowing for sure. Right. They, they had right. a good, the scientists involved had a very, very strong sense that this would work. They weren't sure if it would work through the plutonium side. Right, and it's, okay. One interesting thing is a little side note. You can have a gun type design using plutonium because plutonium's rate of spontaneous fission is too high for that configuration to work. It would just fizzle out when you would try to fire them together. So of that gun design, there are two major components, the two different pieces that get hit together. One is called the projectile, or nicknamed the bullet. And then the other thing is the target, the thing that remains stationary that the other thing gets fired into. So it's not like there are two things on either side and they both have a conventional explosion and they meet in the middle. 
So you imagine like firing it down like the barrel of a gun. One thing stays on the right side and then there's an explosion on the left and it brings it together. But this is something that's always fascinating is that the, there's two pieces of it. One of them is a cylinder and the other one is like a donut, like a long donut with a hole in the middle. And they, this, the donut itself is the thing that gets fired down the barrel and meets the cylinder on the other side. So, ba- huh. so maybe it's like if you go to a restaurant and you order onion rings and there's like gigantic onion rings that are stacked on top of something and there's like a little stick in the middle that holds all the onion rings together. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, yep. a, Yeah, so it's kind of like that. So if you imagine the onion rings being fired down a barrel into the stand that's going to hold the onion rings, that's kind of the way this configuration works. <laughs> So the thing that the USS Indianapolis had was the target, and that was actually made of uranium. It was six rings uh, that were designed to fit into the donut when it got fired over to it. And the rest of the bomb, so they didn't transport the whole bomb, the rest of the firing mechanism, the bullet, the, the donut, the onion rings that get fired into the other thing, that was um, made in a different location. So these things were essentially created and then shipped immediately. So they were created in two different locations. The rest of the material was flown on uh, three C-54 Green Hornet flights from Albuquerque over to the same location, arriving two days later after the USS Indianapolis. So there wasn't the whole bomb if the airplanes didn't make it, say they crashed or those other parts weren't configured in time, there would be no bomb. They still had to assemble it once they actually got to the island. And then that was the thing that was then taken over uh, in the Enola Gay over to Hiroshima. Mm. And most of the sailors, as I mentioned, they didn't know about this mission. They didn't find out about it until after they had gone through this ordeal and they were recovering in Guam. Then they heard about the bomb and then they realized what their mission was. Quint makes it sound like he knew about the bomb ahead of time and that it was their mission and that they delivered it and there was a success. Uh, maybe not, but it seems like maybe when the first time I saw it, I thought that he would knew, but no one knew. Right. Well, if, if they found out afterwards, then it's, it's hard to know, you know? Yeah, it makes at least a sense of We went through all this crazy stuff, but it ended the war. So maybe they feel a little bit not okay, but there's at least more of a sense of it. They wish that there was these other things that would have gone right, but the mission itself was a success. Um, Another thing in the movie I thought was interesting was when Quint said that they they didn't send a distress signal because their mission was secret. So they it was a secret mission, so they wouldn't send a distress signal. But I thought that was interesting within the context of the movie because they were already spotted by a Japanese attack submarine. So they should have sent out a distress signal. You know, in, in real life, that part of their mission wasn't a secret anymore. They had already accomplished their mission. Right, yeah. They had actually gone to Guam to refuel, and then the ship was going to another location to start to get ready for the planned land invasion in case the Japanese didn't surrender. But in real life, distress signals were sent out. Uh, there was a question about whether or not they actually went, you know, made it into the air because the power was out, but they went through the motions to send the signals, and three listening stations in the Navy heard the distress signal. Unfortunately, one of the signals uh, was received by a commander who was drunk, so nothing happened. Another one was received by someone who was asleep and ordered his soldiers not to disturb him because he didn't want to be bothered by anything at that particular time. And then a third one thought it was a Japanese trap, so they didn't do anything. So there was definitely a self, this distress signal sent out. It was received, according to a, a number of sources, and just nothing happened. No one acted on it. And you, you see in the, in the film how maybe this I, this not really explained as far as I know. Maybe we can briefly discuss this, but the, how... Quint goes crazy and smashes the radio equipment as yeah. they're trying, as the sheriff is trying. Oh, that's to another send, really interesting point. Yeah, send a distress signal or contact someone, and in a way that that might be Quint's way mm. of saying, you know, I didn't have one back during the war. We're not going to have one right now. We're gonna we're gonna do this the way it went down. Huh. Um, I wonder if um, – I'm sure people have thought – this is funny now because this is the first time I've thought about this. <laughs> I've seen this movie probably 30 times. There's a sense that he's going through a little bit of PTSD. Sure. He's, he's suffered through this entire experience, and he doesn't want to happen again. Or maybe he's like, I'm going to beat it this time. I'm going to beat the shark. Don't call in someone else to share my glory or to just let me do this. I need this to be ha- – for this to happen. Uh I'm too busy nitpicking <laughs> the, the nuclear stuff. I haven't thought about that, Mike. That's a good point. 
Well, let's maybe we can circle around back to that after we finish the the nuclear points. Yeah, we'll do that in our our parking lot movie discussion at the end. Uh, one, one more thing that I that I saw here, you know, Shark Week. Everybody loves Shark yep. Week on Discovery Channel. <laughs> in uh, 2007, they had an episode called Oceans of Fear, where they concluded that they talked about this event, the USS Indianapolis. And it, it actually looks like the most likely sharks that were involved there were oceanic white tip sharks that attacked the crew. Uh, I think the, uh, Quint mentions tiger sharks. They think that there were some tiger sharks there, but it was mostly this, this other type of shark. And this is a fascinating piece to it. They talk about the shark attacks. Uh, in, in Quint's story, because it's obviously a pretty scary part, and it's a movie about sharks, so it makes sense. But the vast, vast majority of the people who died in the water, they didn't die from shark attacks. They died from exposure to the elements. It was too hot during the day, and it was too cold at night. They would freeze. Starvation. Or dehydration. Yep, yeah. Salt poisoning. The sharks were there, and they would pick off the people when they would separate, when they would try to swim to shore or to some island or something. But mostly they ate the dead. So when they, were, when they would float away, they would eat the dead bodies because sharks are mostly opportunistic eaters. Um, even the, the writer of the book apologized later on for causing a, a generations of people to, to be afraid of sharks. But sharks don't tend to go after people. They don't like to eat humans. They're too big. They're, they, they don't look like they're prey. They, they like to eat wounded seals uh, and other things that are already kind of hurt. So there are some sharks that do that. But it's not the great whites, and it's not a lot of sharks. Well, I've heard that, you know, one, un unfortunately for humans, that is true to an extent. Sharks don't generally, even great whites, don't generally want to eat humans. It's not their part of their diet, so to speak. But, but a lot of times they don't realize that until they take the first bite. Uh, so, after you know, unfortunately for those people who have lost limbs, you know, that's that's how a shark realizes, oh, this isn't. You know, this isn't what I typically eat. This is not, you know, a big fatty seal or whatever. Uh -huh. In some ways, it's comforting. In other ways, it's still <laughs> yep. not so much, you know. Because you still lose a leg or... Right. But at least in terms of the this particular historic event, a lot of the people died from other things. Um, and they also, one fascinating thing is that National Geographic, uh, in the next couple of years, I think actually this summer, are going to go look for the boat again. Because it sunk. The USS Indianapolis oh. sunk. They don't know exactly where. They have a pretty good idea this time around. So they're going to go try to see if they can look down and, and look at the rest of the, the shipwreck and see what else they can find um, down there. So I think that'll be kind of cool. a fun thing. So people should tune in this summer to the, to the National Geographic channel or magazine. I don't know. One of them. So that'll be kind of cool. <laughs> so after this story, after Jaws finished, it was very successful. The uh, producers wanted there to be a prequel that would cover this story, the USS Indianapolis, and would have like right. a young Quint. So you know how in Star Wars now there's going to be like a spin-off story with young Han Solo? They wanted right. to have a young Quint, see what his life was like. But instead, they couldn't That'd do that. That'd be a fascinating casting process, I think. Yeah, who, who's grizzled enough as a younger? Well, it's pre-grizzled. I don't know what it was like. Maybe it was grizzled on the ship, but... Uh... Yeah, he had to have always talked that way to some degree. You'd hope so. I, I, yeah. wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want it to be something that he picks up when, later on when he moves to, uh, to Amity. But instead of this movie, they, this prequel, they made Jaws 2. That was their, their replacement for this. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you heard about this. I know we, we like to joke when we work together about Nick Cage movies. But in 2016, there was another movie that dealt with uh, the USS Indianapolis. It's called USS Indianapolis, colon, Men of Courage. That rings a bell. I can guarantee you I've never seen it. Which is probably puts me in the company of most people. Yes, um, and I and I uh, I'm a good friend. I did not ask you to watch it um, for the purpose <laughs> of this podcast. I did. Right. I watched it a couple days ago. It's on Netflix right now. Okay. Um, I don't think it went out in theaters. It's not a great movie. Um, <laughs> it's right. kind of odd. It's a weird Nick Cage project, but it covers the story. And it's funny. There are actually some parts of the story where they get exactly right. There's a scene where they're welding the uranium cylinder into the room that they were talking. So that was kind of a cool thing. They also, there's a scene where they're bringing in a giant crate. So they got those weird pieces of it correct, which I thought was kind of a cool addition to this weird no one saw it movie with Nick Cage. Yeah. They talk about a top secret non-escorted mission and all the various details. But one thing is that at some point Nick Cage asks if the cylinder in the crate had something to do with the Manhattan Project. Which I would think is insane because who, how would he, as a captain of the Navy, 
not involved in the Manhattan Project at all <laughs> know what they were talking about. Maybe there's some possible way. Maybe he's got a cousin who works uh, in Livermore or Los Alamos or something. But it's just odd that that term wasn't really – not everybody knew about the Manhattan Project. They thought it was something else, but no one knew that it was this top secret thing. I think you can probably attribute that to um, maybe just Nick Cage not learning the script well enough, and no one's going to correct him, you know? He's Nick Cage. I wouldn't correct him. That, that's a cynical way to look at it. but well, I don't want him freaking out on me. So that's the USS Indianapolis discussion. I thought that was um, a fascinating kind of look. It's only a tiny little scene. There's only a few mentions of the, of the bomb, but it's, it's cool to see what Quint's role in, the, in nuclear history was. It certainly played a, a big role in... And it's, it's enough to be brought up. It, this movie didn't need him to be on the USS Indianapolis. It could have just been right. scary without that scene, but they added it in for the movie. It's a cool addition for sure. Yeah, I think it, 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 the fact that it's in the movie ties in perhaps to some theories about the nuclear shark, which we're going to discuss. Let's, let's, get, let's do that right now because I think yeah. there's a reason why this whole stuff is in here. Because sure. – I have a what I think is a dumb but really foolproof theory that Jaws is actually a radioactivity-fueled great white shark hell-bent on seeking revenge against those that have killed his friends and family and turned him into the monster that we see on film. <laughs> that he is personally affected by either the Hiroshima bomb, the Nagasaki bomb, or some sort of nuclear testing that was done out in the ocean. And let me run through my data real quickly. Please feel free to interrupt mm -hmm. me. But I have three points that I want to make that I think my case is it's going to be pretty strong here. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, our listeners say as well. First, I think for a moment we should consider Godzilla, a giant, angry, prehistoric sea monster that, according to the canon of those stories, was awoken from his slumber and given all of these amazing powers because of nuclear radiation either from atomic testing, uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, or later in the most recent one of those movies, uh, the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant disaster. Um, mm. And I think that Bruce the shark is Godzilla of the sea. You know how tuna is the chicken of the sea? I think <laughs> that Bruce is the Godzilla of the sea. Um, and my, se my second point is great white sharks are known to be heavily concentrated in waters, according to my science shark research, between 54 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature. That's where they like to hang out. This includes high concentrations near Japan. See? It's all kind of falling together. They tend to go yep. north by Japan. Quint is a member of the crew responsible for bringing the atomic bomb, the Hiroshima bomb, over to Japan. So he's, he's heavily linked into this. I think either the Hiroshima bomb or U.S. testing that was done in the South Pacific transformed Bruce from what you would normally have for a male great white shark, about 15 feet long, one ton heavy, turned it into a 25 foot long, three ton sea beast. It makes sense. Male sharks tend to be a lot smaller than the female ones. So he's not only out of his, his it's, it's weird that he's this big and large, but you know, as you mentioned earlier, he's strong enough to submerge three barrels, poke a hole in a boat and sink the orca. And he also, he's got a few facial features that, don't, that these sharks don't have. Uh, he's got a jowl on his face. <laughs> like he's got literal jowls when he opens his mouth, which sharks don't have. So it's clearly some kind of mutation, uh, maybe something to express his vengeance and his, his anger to humans so they know this is not a regular shark. This is something that, they, that they're – this is their comeuppance when they come <laughs> back. And, uh, and most great whites, uh, sharks prefer tuna. Um, Bruce seems to prefer humans, especially those that were involved in the nuclear bomb history. So I have no idea how many other Manhattan Project scientists that he might have devoured in the past. We don't know. That prequel was never made. But I assume that there's a lot of them. And finally, I think that Bruce probably targeted Amity to draw Quint out, out to sea, so that he could then seek revenge. That makes sense to me why he would go there. But you might be asking me, why would this mindless eating machine have the intelligence to do this. Well, my final point is, is that in the Jaws canon, in Jaws 4, The Revenge, it's established that the shark that's attacking Brody's wife, because in that story, Brody had passed away by a heart attack earlier, probably because he was scared of sharks, that a, a new shark is coming and attacking Brody's wife and their family, and that it's a descendant of Bruce himself. 
clearly he's out for revenge. You know, the men the, in the title, the the Jaws, the revenge. So this new shark can track her all the way from Amity Island, where she leaves to go on vacation and start a new life in the Bahamas. But she leaves by airplane. This shark can follow her. There's clearly some kind of connection between the shark and the Brody family, and I think there was some sort of magic or mental connection. It's the same connection between Bruce and his descendants and those that have wronged him, including Quint, the Atomic Bomb Project, and the Brody family. So I don't know. What, you, what do you think about When I put all this together, it makes <laughs> a lot of sense to me. I, I think you might be onto something there. Um, one of the first things that I thought about in terms of the intelligence of the shark is – there's this uh, another movie that came out, I think, in the late '90s called Deep Blue Sea, mm-hmm. and so in that movie, you have several sharks, great white sharks, that are experimented on for Alzheimer's research, essentially. And of course, um, this is a movie, by the way, which has Samuel L. Jackson before he was dealing with snakes on a plane, he was dealing with great white sharks underwater. It's a natural transition, <laughs> uh, but these. In the movie, as a result of these experiments, the sharks, they gain an increased sense of intelligence more than great white, white sharks should have. So they're able to able to th- actually approach critical thinking, mm-hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. In, in a way, you, you might be onto something in that it's not too far-fetched to think that the effects of nuclear radiation may have had uh, an intelligence enhancing effect in the way, same way that they enhance the size, physical size of the sharks mm-hmm. um, to the degree that they're able to have cognitive functioning and, and track their prey over long distances, mm-hmm. and even, appro- even approach a level where they have emotions. Who knows? If, they, if the radioactivity affected some part of the shark's brain, it was probably that part of the brain that is focused on revenge. Sure. Yeah, makes sense to the, me. What is that? The medulla oblongata, something like that. <laughs> uh, I think so, Professor. I think that's exactly what it was. Yeah. <laughs> and and maybe putting, you know, so there's that very hypothetical but plausible, you know, of course plausible science there. There's also maybe an element of the shark acting as um, some, you know, some de- device for uh, fate in the movie. In that hmm. we talked a little bit about Quint's, you know, he's going berserk. In many scenes on the boat, he sma- you know, smashes the radio. He also, he basically purposely, he overworks the engine, even mm-hmm. though, even though Hooper is repeatedly warns him, "You're going to burn it out. You're going to burn it out." He doesn't seem to care. He, on multiple occasions, he can, he can stop the ship from from being stranded, so that he's mano a mano with the shark. You know, he has multiple chances to avoid that. He seems to relish the opportunity. For one of two things, to be able to face the shark on similar terms that he faced the sharks when he was in the ocean with his comrades Mm -hmm. after the USS Indianapolis sunk. You might also wonder if he basically has a death wish. Um, He recounted how one of his comrades was essentially bitten in half by one of the sharks, which is how he basically dies in the end. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to go out on a, a ledge here, maybe he, in some respects, feels guilt for the bombings that happened, and, and that's part of the reason he has a death hmm. wish. And this is simply a means of, you know, he didn't he doesn't want to die an old man in a hospital home. He, you know, that's why he doesn't want people to come rescue them. That's why he bashes the radio. He feels like this is sort of karmic in a way. Maybe the, the shark instinctively realizes that and this is just meant to be you know it makes sense and it's probably from the shark's perspective too i'm sure he's eaten a lot of other manhattan project scientists you know when they were out sailing or something but it's only quint that he finally meets his match you know one of the guys who survived this uss indianapolis and also survived for years and years and years hunting other sharks too like this is finally his peer that's probably why he saved him for near the end and right and, and did it at the end is he sees Maybe Quint will be the one to defeat him. And uh, it's obviously not going to be Hooper. Hooper's just he's a mess. <laughs> he's hiding underwater. And uh, he beats he beats Quint. He thinks that it's the end of the day that he's just going to get this other guy down pretty good. But and it, it, was, it was one step too far. It was too much hubris. Because he said, I'm also going to eat your scuba tank so you can't hide like Hooper underwater. 
I'm going to eat this scuba tank, and then I'm going to eat you. And then he bit off one more scuba tank than he can chew. But I think, unfortunately, I, you know, I want to be an honest researcher here. There is a major counterpoint to my theory. And again, it's Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. In 2016, had an episode called Nuclear Sharks. So if you Google Nuclear Shark, you're going to get this Shark Week episode from last year. And it's about the Bikini Atoll, which is out in the South Pacific. And from 1946 to 1958, it was the site of 23 nuclear tests. And these nuclear tests were some of the largest ones that we have ever done. One of them, the Castle Bravo test, was 1,000 times larger than the Hiroshima explosion. Uh, it created a four-mile size fireball, 15 megaton yield, gigantic, way more than the scientists initially expected. And all of these tests have killed pretty much all the reef and wildlife in this particular atoll. But for some reason, this place, you know, which is about 2,600 miles southwest of Hawaii, and some of the surrounding islands, sharks have returned. Despite the radioactivity near the test site, a few miles away, sharks have returned, and Shark Week wanted to figure out why. So Philippe and Ashlyn Cousteau, uh, I guess Philippe is the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, the famous marine explorer, they went to the islands and GPS tagged a bunch of sharks, trying to find out where they came from, why are they all still there. There were no marine life right around the crater site, which is kind of eerie to think about. There's no reefs or anything. There were a few little tiny fish that normally latch on to larger sharks, but there were mm. no other sharks there. So it's kind of a, it was a very weird thing, but there were no other sharks there. But they went, again, like I said, they went to the surrounding area. And it, it, they didn't think that this would happen because these sharks, these particular reef sharks, were known at the time to be not migratory, that they stay near their reef and they don't go anywhere else. So they were wondering where the sharks came from. And I guess the result of this story, I'm not really an expert on sharks, um, is that they are migratory to some degree and that there is yeah. a little bit of movement around. So they've returned to the places where their life had been destroyed and now they're slowly making their way back. And even a couple of ships, U.S. ships like the USS Saratoga, that was used to test the effects of nuclear bombs against naval vessels. So they fired a couple of nuclear weapons, one uh, above ground and then another one underwater to see what the effects were. Another one of the ships that were there was a Japanese vessel that was captured after the Japanese uh, surrendered and then brought over to this test site, the, uh, the Nagato. Um, they sunk both of those ships with nuclear <laughs> testing and those sunk to the water and coral reefs have formed around the, the ships. And there are a ton of sharks that are hanging out right around in that area. The point is, is that this radioactivity is clearly not turned all of these sharks into other gigantic bruises. So I think maybe this is a counterpoint to the idea that radioactivity doesn't turn um, sharks into, into gigantic other sharks. But it's something, something to consider. Or maybe a compromise is that it doesn't turn all sharks into... Bruce the shark. Just maybe just Bruce. Maybe Bruce had so much anger to seek in revenge that fueled all of this stuff together. Could be. Could be. So enough of that. Let's move on to our parking lot movie discussion. So we've watched the movie. We're outside before we head home, having a little chat out in the parking lot. Mike, I know this movie terrified you, but what do you think about it? Um, yeah, I think it's great. I did. I read an interview or an excerpt of an interview with Spielberg where he he said he would he was initially approached to make this movie make a movie of the book uh but he had one condition and that was that he would not show the shark for the first hour of the movie hmm. it could not be it, it, the audience couldn't see the shark and i think that's what makes this so effective yeah is because you know in, in the tradition of great horror movies perfect example being the blair witch project you never see anything but it's still from my point of view, terrifying. It, mm -hmm. it plays upon, it, it forces your mind to come up with the terrifying uh, images instead of just serving it up on a platter immediately, which too many horror movies I think do nowadays. So that's mm -hmm. one re reason I think it's so effective. Um, and to this day, why it's so, you know, so many people, at least in the back of their minds, when they approach a large body of water have you know it's just it's the unknown the affair of the unknown there's so much that can be under there that you can't see until mm -hmm. when you see it you see it and you're dead <laughs> um, yeah 
the way that the shark is slowly revealed more and more is great in terms of building the suspense and really I'm I'm sure at that time you know it was it was advanced in terms of machinery of how they operated the shark uh, making it look realistic yeah a lot of the dialogue is 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 great in the fact that it was written by the guy who was the inspiration for Walter from the Beagle Task <laughs> tends to make sense well one thing that I was really I was really surprised upon watching it rewatching it recently was that and maybe standards have changed over the last 30 years or so but it's only pg right it's a pg rated movie it is um, it, it's would not be a pg movie these days at all and and i i noticed of, okay so there's very minimal swearing in there and there's maybe they went out of their way to compensate for the violence by really having nothing else that hmm. could possibly bump it up to pg-13 after well, all pg-13 wasn't a thing yet there oh, was there was that, pg that, and there was <laughs> r well that explains. so it's funny enough you, we talked about red dawn earlier the two movies yeah. or a couple of the movies that really brought that into a, a reality that it needed to be another area between pg and r was yeah. indiana jones and the temple of doom the oh. whole scene where that guy Gal gets his heart yeah. written. yep yeah. Uh, that's uh, they would someone gets their heart pulled out of them and they still see it beating before they die. That's uh, that's probably not something to show your children. Yeah, I think that's another movie I saw too young. Um, it's a theme with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so Red Dawn was actually one of the first, I think, PG thirteen movies. So it, it took okay, that. I was gonna say. Yeah, it took that into like effect. An R. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there was I mean, a lot of shooting and stuff, but it, was, it would have been a PG movie a couple years before. But I don't really have much else to add except the fact that I agree. What you, were, what you had already mentioned, and that especially how the suspensefulness of this movie and the pacing of it still holds up, for me at least, to, to this day. I showed it to my wife for the, her seeing it the first time a couple days ago. We had some beach vacation planned later this summer, and she didn't cancel it, but she definitely made me watch the movie with the lights on. Uh, because <laughs> I'm sure she'll be thinking about it when we're back on the water. But one thing I'll mention is you talked about like how horror movies, some of the best ones are those that you don't see the thing that's trying to get right. you, yeah. uh, and you fill it in with your imagination. I think this movie is great because it's kind of a lot like some of the best zombie movies, where the zombies are certainly a threat, but the real threat is people and humanity and kind of how we break down when yeah. bad things happen like this. Because I think the townspeople in this movie <laughs> are the absolute worst they all they care about <laughs> is their summer beach money. They just need that summer sweet summer beach money so they can I don't know buy another boat to do something with. Or it's always like they have to they have to make the money so they don't care if a tourist comes in and gets eaten. It doesn't bother them. You know, let's take the risk. Let's roll the dice. They're not really uh, at risk adverse yeah. is what they should be when it comes to shark attack because you have one shark attack and it's proven to be a shark attack no one's going to come to your beach ever again so i think that's kind of interesting i think the townspeople are almost the true horror of this movie because still you know if my theory holds up jaws is just seeking revenge and if he's he seems to be the hero of the story and quint's the uh the antagonist he's doing what sharks do um the townspeople have no excuse no i'd agree but also i, w I would add that another thing that makes the movie so effective effectively frightening they're using something that actually exists, right? So great sharks do uh -huh. exist. They do kill people. Um, although I don't have the stats. I know it's not. There's that old saying, you're more likely to be eaten by a shark than fill in the blank or struck by lightning. So obviously it's not that common uh -huh. to use a real something that exists. Um, and as Hooper mentions in the movie, you know, it's from an evolutionary point of view, it's a perfect specimen. All it does is... What does he say? It it eats and it makes more sharks. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is a an animal that has survived since the dinosaurs for the sole reason that it's it's the perfect predator in in every way. Um, and then we have to go and make it better by dousing it with radioactivity. <laughs> and, and like all right, comic right. books, that's how people get their powers. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we flew too close to the sun or swam too close to an atomic bomb. Or something. Some there's some metaphor there that I can't imagine. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up. Let's uh, let's give it a rating. We uh, always like to rate the, our movies out of one out of five to you know have a good comparison over the cross of all of our films. But we also want to make sure that we are tailored in our rating system for the particular movie so that we can get an accurate rating for this one. How about one out of five barrels? 
you know, the barrels that they use to tie the shark, so, uh, tie to the shark so it doesn't swim underwater. Because uh, I think if you got one of those barrels, it's weak. It's not going to keep any shark at all above the water. Um, but you got five barrels. That's pretty good. I don't know if Jaws could handle five barrels. Maybe. Maybe Bruce the shark could handle five. But I think five is a pretty good thing. So let's say how many uh, barrels, one out of five, would you give this? I'm going to give it four. If we're going with five being the strongest, right? Five being the yeah the best. Yeah, unstoppable. Um, yeah, I think you know for all the reasons we talked about, um, it's a really strong film. It still holds up. It's the story's great. It's good acting. For some reason, I can't give it a. F- and you can go. By the f- way, you can go if you want to. You can go half a barrel. Now, half a <laughs> barrel may not work because if you cut a barrel in half, it's no longer buoyant. But let's pretend like yeah. it's a smaller barrel. Like they've got like you've got a keg and you've got a pony keg. This is like a pony barrel. If you would like to go fractional, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go that route. Four and a half. Four and a half barrels. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna give it five. I don't. This might be the first time I've given a perfect rating uh, on our <laughs> podcast. I just think this movie is a delight. Uh, there are some things that are maybe a little um, weird about the the, the dated nature of, of the movie um, a little bit, but I think all that stuff that charm kind of comes together well for me and I, I enjoy this movie i still enjoy it i would have loved to have seen this movie when it first came out and to see what people how scared they were how amazed people must have been when they first saw it because it was such a, a groundbreaking film and i think the fact that we're still talking about it since 1975 and it's just a movie it's a simple story about three people trying to take down a shark i think the, the way it was and the way it was made and holds up I, i'd be willing to give this one a five you raise a good point, which is that you wish you could have seen it in 1975. And I, I guess I have to constantly remind myself of I, – maybe I have this unconscious bias against older films because in my mind, for some reason, I'm comparing what they were able to do back then to what they can do today. But that being said, in, in many ways, it's a superior film to – if it were released today, because you're not relying on CGI, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, they had to construct this thing, the shark from, uh, I guess from scratch and and it, it it always looked, it always looked real enough to me. Yeah. I know people like to joke about how it looked fake, but, uh, and the fact that it had, I never never get that either. Yeah. Well, they joke about how it had jowls. Like I I, I joked earlier about how it, how if you did research. Yeah. If you, but supposedly the jowls were because it was the mechanism, the, mechanical mechanism to make the jaw move up and down caused okay. a wrinkle on the uh, on the skin of the shark so that's fine it's you know it's what they did the best <laughs> that they could supposedly the first time they put the shark in the water they had never tested it in water and it just sank <laughs> to the bottom of the tank so they had to retrieve it and rebuild it the funny thing is you know we have the we have the jaws theme song the you know dona dona all that right. stuff well, that's been parodied so much uh, oh yeah but you know over the years and all of the kind of jaws tricks were used in later films. So it's weird to think that there was a time where this was, you know, it probably drew from other movies and inspiration before it, but it was certainly a film that uh, people have, have found a lasting impression with and have continued to use it as a source for their own inspirations. And essentially made Steven Spielberg's career. Oh, for sure. Or la- la- launched it, anyway. Yeah, well, maybe his last movie, too, will be another Jaws movie. Maybe he'll end, he'll end his career, he'll retire with a jaws i don't know what it would be finally make the prequel exactly or maybe it'll be like yeah. jaws in space or something oh let's let's knock out the sharknado route <laughs> <laughs> that's true we haven't talked about sharknado which i think is intentional <laughs> um well speaking of other shark things uh i have a couple of stuff we like to recommend at the end of the podcast for if people are interested in this subject matter the nuke side of the movie or just they like sharks and shark films uh i've got three things that i'd recommend people that listen to check out First is that Shark Week episode I talked about earlier, the nuclear shark from 2016. Uh, it's on YouTube, or you can get it if you get uh, Discovery Channel somewhere else. It's not a great episode. It's because it ultimately the conclusion is, oh, turns out we didn't know that these sharks can move around. Uh, but it's kind of cool. There's a lot of history of the area uh, where they, we did so many of these nuclear tests. Essentially, in a paradise, beautiful location, we nuked it a couple times eventually before we went to underground nuclear testing uh, out in, the, in Nevada. So, but it's a cool story. I think it's worth checking out. The second thing is a, there's a group called Atomic History who collects firsthand accounts of people who were involved in the Manhattan Project and try to get a sense of kind of what their life was like, a lot of oral history. And they have a great page 
dedicated to the USS Indianapolis and its role in nuclear history. I think there's even a mention at the end about Quint's story in Jaws. So I will link to that in our show notes and on our website, supercriticalpodcast.com, so you can kind of check that out. It's a cool way of how people that deal with new things look at this story. And finally, there's two movies I'd recommend that these have terrified me. Uh, from 2003, a movie called Open Water, and the sequel, Open Water 2, colon, Adrift, from 2006. <laughs> Mike, I don't know, have you heard about these movies before? I have. I don't think I've seen them. I recommend it. They were on Netflix for quite a while. Uh, these stories are really scary because one of them, it's based on a real life, another real-life story of two people on vacation, a, like a husband and a wife on vacation. Were they left? Was it they yes. were left behind? Okay, yeah. I've seen the previews. I have not seen the movie. Yeah, yeah. Due, due to an accounting error, because uh, they're supposed to count heads of the people yeah. that go in the water. They're on vacation. They are on a charter boat. They go out and and they scuba together in like a buddy system. And then because someone messes up the count, uh, they forget that these people are there, and the boat goes and leaves them. And it's these two people. They have some oxygen, right? They have these mm-hmm. really fancy life vests, and they have fins but they're just there by themselves and there are sharks in the water and it's these two people trying to deal with that and it's a really cool story scary and terrifying my brother and dad were certified scuba divers at the time when this movie came out and um i was uh, i'd watch them and then i'd watch the movie and then call them and say you guys need to be careful <laughs> when you guys that get out that there sounds yeah that sounds genuinely terrifying <laughs> the sequel to it is even it's kind of scarier because how would you do a sequel to that what they did was there was a, a boat, a yacht that some one of their this group of friends had, and this one lady had a baby who came on the boat, and they were taking care of the baby, and then they pick her up as a goof and throw her overboard, and they all jump out of the boat and they start hanging out in the water, and they're all swimming, having a good time, but someone forgot to put the ladder down from the side of the boat, and there's no way on this particular boat for them to get back into the boat. So they're they're out in the middle of the ocean. They're right next to a yacht, but it's too tall. They can't get up. Yeah. The ladder is up, and there's no rope there or anything, and they can't climb up it. So it's even scarier because it's something that they can get to right there, and they can't get to it. And the whole time, the baby starts crying, and there's no one there to help them. It's terrifying. And then, of course, there's sharks. Um, mm, yeah, of course. Of course, there are sharks. So I think th- those two movies there, if you really – want to be scared again uh, about water and sharks and various things um, and how you're maybe worried about being a parent at some point in your life, leaving your baby <laughs> on a boat. Uh, it's pretty scary stuff. So I'd recommend those things. But uh, what about you, Mike? Do you have anything? I guess in terms of the one recommendation would be the one I mentioned earlier, which is um, not nuclear related, but definitely shark related, which is uh, Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> um, if you're interested in, in seeing similarly to Jaws, more intelligent than normal shark behavior and Samuel L. Jackson trying to survive sharks. It, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, I'm not going to give accolades for the the writing or the acting necessarily, but it's an entertaining movie. It um, is. It's, it's a fun one. And then I'm just, and this is maybe uh, going out on a limb a little bit, but along the lines of would you say it was going out on a limb or like a <laughs> like a plank, like some kind of plank on the side of a boat? Maybe you have to walk the plank. Eh, sorry, plank. Yeah, nautical stuff. <laughs> well, in terms of you know creatures that were either scared of or mortified by that are altered by human behavior, and then we have to confront them. I would I'd also throw out the movie Mimic. Um, which I came out around the same time. It involves the basic plot is uh, there's a plague in New York City that's being spread by cockroaches, and and Mira Sorvino, who is one of the doctors in the movie, comes up with a way to genetically alter the cockroaches so that they carry a an antidote for the the disease that's mm-hmm. being spread, and it works, and it and it kills off. Um, uh, other animals like rats, etc. Um, and then fast forward a few years, and the cockroaches are not only are they extremely intelligent, but they've learned to evolve very quickly into forms that resemble humans. So oh God! Oh God! I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but it's actually a truly creepy and pretty well done movie. Um, 
it tangentially related to what we're talking about here. Dude, we're not safe anywhere. We're not safe in the water. <laughs> we're not safe in yeah. our homes. Now nah, we're stuck. Uh, land, sea, or air. Because you're on in the air, you got you have snakes. Yes. Yeah, not to worry about. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Appreciate you coming on here and and giving your keen insight, even for a movie I've seen like thirty times, learning more and more. So I appreciate your side <laughs> of it. I'm glad you can see the movie and enjoy it without having to worry about the nuclear side like I do. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. And I, you know, I had never really known about the nuclear component to this movie, and it was fascinating learning about it. So hoping the audience feels the same. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or, you know, want to tell us what we got wrong, there are a couple of ways you can contact the show. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash supercriticalpodcast. We're on Twitter, at Nuclear Podcast. And email, supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. And if you've enjoyed the program, we'd appreciate it if you would consider subscribing on iTunes or wherever you listen and leave a review. It really helps us grow the show. And uh, we can also, you can put some comments there about what future episodes we should handle. So until next time, this has been Tim Westmeyer. This has been Mike. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we are bound to get super critical about it. Have a good one and stay out of the water.